Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm talking about informal evaluations or those teacher walkthroughs that your principal or assistant principal does throughout the year, throughout the day. And I'm going to give you some tips and tricks to help you look amazing during your teacher evaluations and your teacher walkthroughs. You definitely want to do these practices no matter what. So this is not just for evaluations. I want to make that very, very clear. It's my goal to help you become a highly effective instructor, not just get a check mark on your evaluations. But I do know that it can be stressful, you know, having your principal walk in or your assistant principal walk in. And so some of these tips and tricks will help you become more comfortable in that situation. I myself have been a teacher and I have been an assistant principal. So I have had teacher evaluations and walkthroughs done on me. And I have also conducted walkthroughs and teacher evaluations. So I've been on both sides of the situation and I want to share some knowledge with you today that'll help you during these situations. Now, the first thing is we're talking about just those informal walkthroughs when your principal shows up unexpected or your assistant principal shows up unexpected. And inevitably it happens during a time where kids are packing up or there's chaos or it's after lunch. And I want you to remember that your assistant principal or principal is not trying to play gotcha with you. They might just be running late on their walkthroughs and they need to do like four before the end of the day. So they're, you know, rushing into classrooms and it might not be always be the opportune time. All right. So that's okay. Cut them a little bit of slack and they'll cut you a little bit of slack. Now, you know, some people do try to come in at the end of the period to see if teachers are teaching bell to bell. And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, typically, if your you know, principal comes in the last 15 minutes of a period, you know, you should still be teaching at that time. They're not trying to play got you with you. They're just coming into your classroom. So um, a couple things you can do to mitigate that whole situation. First of all, always do your best to teach bell to bell. What does that mean? That means that the moment the bell rings, at the beginning of class and the moment the bell rings at the end of class, you are teaching or students are engaged or there's instruction going on. A lot of teachers give their students the last five minutes to pack up, the last 10 minutes to pack up. I've even seen the last 15 minutes to pack up. That is not a good practice to be doing throughout your year. Now, I know some days you are tired and you're like, you know what, just pack up and just, I don't care what you do, just don't talk to me. I totally understand that. But you don't want to do that in the classroom. Here's why. Five minutes of packing up every day, every week throughout the year comes out to be hours and hours and hours of lost instructional time. And so when you think of it that way, um, you can see why teaching bell to bell is so important. I remember as a new teacher, my principal put a chart up on the board to show, or during his presentation, to show what just five minutes of packing up before the bell rings, 10 minutes of packing up before the bell rings, and 15 minutes of packing up before the bell rings, what that equates to at the end of the year. And it was so many hours that it was staggering. So that really stuck with me. So after that presentation, I always tried to teach bell to bell. Now, I know that they need time to pack up, but you wanna make sure that you get comfortable with pushing everything towards the end of the lesson or to the end of the period. You don't wanna be you know, out of things to do 20 minutes before the end, 10, 15 minutes before the end. It's just not good practice. So make sure when you're planning your lessons that you have enough to do so that you hit that bell to bell. Now, you'll get better at that as you become a teacher and you you know get acclimated. You almost kind of become one with the bell system when you become a teacher and you've been doing it a long time. You can like, you kind of like have this internal clock that's going on. So you'll get better at that, but do make sure that you're teaching bell to bell because that's going to really help you, you know, to look good in your principal's eyes, but also it's just good practice. Don't let the kids pack up too early every single day. They're missing out on valuable instructional time, period. It's not good to do. Okay. The next thing that you really want to make sure you do is have solid lesson plans. Now we just did a few videos on lesson planning and so you're gonna to wanna to check those out, but your lesson plans need to be living, breathing documents that you can adapt 
And you want to make sure that they reflect what you're doing in your, uh, your lesson, what you're doing in your instruction. When I would conduct teacher evaluations, we used to have the teachers put the lesson plans by the door. So if there was a walkthrough or an evaluation, I can grab the lesson plan, look to see where the teacher is and see if he or she is on the lesson. Now, I know that things happen, fire drills, kids don't get it, maybe there was a situation, whatever, not everything stays according to plan, of course, but that's why lesson plans should be living, breathing documents where you adapt them throughout the week if you need to. And sometimes that means just putting a sticky note on Wednesday and saying, we need to redo Wednesday. Wednesday was a mess. We're going to redo Wednesday for Thursday, so I'm a day behind. If you just put that sticky note on the lesson plan and I pick up your lesson plans, I know right away that you were thinking ahead of time and you adapted your lesson plan. It doesn't mean you have to redo the whole document and start from scratch. It just means you put a sticky note on there and you let the evaluator know we are a day behind. There was a bell or there was a fire drill or something happened and we're a day behind. So make sure you adapt your lesson plans for what's going on in your classroom. The next thing you want to do is use your objectives. Now your objectives should be aligned to the standards and we talked about that in our lesson planning videos in our objectives video. So make sure you check those out, but you always want to make sure that you have those objectives clearly stated on your board and you also want to be communicating those objectives to your students. Now, please, do not be one of those teachers who just says, I put objectives on the board and they're the same objectives for the whole entire year. That is so annoying to an assistant principal or a curriculum specialist or someone who is really involved in the instructional leadership part of your school. I really disliked it when I would go into a room and I would see that the, the, the objectives were the same every single day. In fact, if you tried to erase them off the board, they were like permanently on the whiteboard because they've been up there for so long. Objectives like your lesson plans are dynamic. They should be living, breathing things that um, get more complex as you move through a lesson and, you know, start off introductory as you start a lesson. Just putting up the same objectives over and over again to check a box is not good practice. Objectives should drive your instruction. Students should be aware of the objectives throughout the lesson so that they know what's going on and they know what they're responsible for. And objectives really help to frame the learning. So it's not just something to check a box for your evaluations or check a box on your lesson plans. It really is a way to drive instruction in your classroom so your students know what is expected of them during the lesson and so you can measure to determine if they got what is going on. Effective teaching is about measuring if your students met those standards and objectives help you do that. So don't be one of those cynical teachers that you know, are like, I don't use objectives, it's stupid, it's just a thing my principal makes me do. It's actually research-based, it's really, really important that we use them and definitely revisit them with your students throughout the lesson. Now, a quick thing here for you, when your principal walks in, it doesn't hurt to stop and say, you know, after you've done a few things, hey guys, did we meet objective two today? And your students may say, yeah, we met objective two. That really impresses instructional leader when he or she goes into your classroom. Now, obviously you can't do that on a whim one time. That has to be something that's a, that's a, um, a habit in your classroom. And so get in that habit of when you feel students have met an objective, say, hey, did we meet objective two? Did we meet objective three? And get your students excited when they meet those objectives. Because then when you have that walkthrough and your instructional leader comes into the room to evaluate you, it's not a staged thing. It's part of your instruction. So that's really, really important to do. And I highly recommend that for your walkthroughs and your formal evaluations. Now, another thing you want to pay attention to when you're working in your classroom and you're thinking about your walkthroughs is your questioning techniques. Now, this can be very complicated and there's so much professional development out there on questioning, but I'm going to give you a couple tidbits you can use each day and get better and better. Now, the first thing you want to think about in terms of questioning is asking the right questions. You don't want to just ask low level rote memory questions. Okay. And what I mean by that is you don't just want to ask students, for example, I always use biology as an example, because I was a biology teacher, but let's say I asked the kids, what are the four nitrogen bases? And they say adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, right? It sounds complicated, but it's not. That's a memory question. That's just memorizing the four nitrogen bases of the DNA molecule. 
it doesn't mean any high level rigor going on in the thinking process. The other thing is sometimes students call out during that questioning and they fail to raise their hands. Now, raising their hands is not just something that, you know, contributes to a well-organized, you know, um, uh, efficient classroom, but it also means that you're waiting for kids to think about the question you asked before you just let them call out. Now, the reason why calling out for low level questions is not the way to, to use questioning in your classroom is because you'll get those students who just sit in the back of the classroom and wait for everyone else just to answer the questions for them. And when you have that habit of just allowing students to call out and asking low level questions, those just rote memory questions, students are just answering the questions for other students. They're not raising their hand. They're not thinking critically. So try to avoid that practice. And I only tell you that because I did that my first evaluation. I thought things were going so well during my first evaluation. I was asking questions, students were answering, and I thought for sure I just nailed it. But when I went in to talk to my principal, he actually told me, look, you're doing a good job, you're a beginning teacher, but I wanna tell you, those are low level questions that you're asking. They're rote memory, meaning the students just had to memorize them and they know the answer. And you're allowing students to call out in unison, they call it unison response. And that means that some kids are calling out and it's always the same kids over and over again answering the questions. And those who really should be engaged are not because they know that those kids are gonna answer the questions, they're not gonna be called on, and you know they don't have to do any of the work or they don't, um, they're too afraid to try to engage. So it's really important that you ask high level questions and you require students to raise their hand. Now, we're gonna build on that. High level questions, let's start there. High level questions are easy to do on the spot. All you have to do is say why or how or say more about that. What does that look like? I'll give you an example. So I just used the example of the four nitrogen bases, right? What are the four nitrogen bases of the DNA molecule? And, the, and somebody raises his hand or her hand and says, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, okay? That's a level one question. That's a low level question. All the student had to do was memorize those, those four nitrogen bases. It sounds complicated, but it's not. So then I might ask, okay, how do they work together on the DNA molecule in order to make, you know, the genetic code? Now the student has to dig deeper and figure out not just what the names are, but how they work on the DNA molecule. You just bumped that up a level, okay? And then you could ask, well, why does that happen? And then they got to dig even deeper and talk more about it. Okay, so you don't let the student off the hook. You might ask the same student those three questions or you might move to another student or another student. But what you've done is you went from a level one question to a level three question, a high level question. So you're increasing that rigor. And that's really easy to do when your administrator walks in and is you know, reviewing your instruction you are able to bump that level of questioning. Now remember, it's not just about the evaluation. Bumping the level of questioning is important for any classroom, for any type of instruction. It makes you a better teacher. So we're not just doing this for the evaluation piece. We're not just doing this for the walkthrough. This actually makes classes better, all right? Now the other thing is the, the raising of the hand. Make sure that you're waiting for students to raise their hands. Now at first, especially if you've been um, part of that unison response, it's hard to break that habit, okay? So you're gonna have to really work on breaking that habit of allowing students to call out. Once they start raising their hands, the same kids will raise their hands. The same kid who always answers is gonna raise her hand or his hand. You wait, it's called wait time. You wait until other students raise their hands. Give everybody a chance to answer. Some teachers use popsicle sticks with students' names on them throughout a lesson, and when one student answers, they go outside of the little cup of popsicle sticks, and you can organize it that way to make sure every student is answering, or you can just eyeball it and just make sure that everybody is engaged. Not every student wants to answer questions, and that's okay, but you wanna create an atmosphere where students are able to answer questions, right? Now, I mentioned wait time just a second ago. I'm the worst at wait time. Wait time is when you allow that dead air to happen in your classroom and you don't let the kids off the hook. So for example, 
Let's say we said, what are the four nitrogen bases of the DNA molecule? And the student answers, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, okay? And then I say, okay, class, that is correct, good job. How do they work together on the DNA molecule in order to you know, build the genetic code? And it's silence, crickets. Everybody's waiting on somebody else to answer. Usually, and I'm talking about myself here, the teacher will jump in and save the students, help them off the hook. Because that, that dead air, that silence is so uncomfortable. It is for me. I hate it. I hate it. I hate the dead air. So I have to really stop myself from jumping in and saving the students. And so let it, let it go. Let them sit there and think about it. Once they realize that you're not going to let them off the hook, they will start to raise their hand because the silence is awkward for them too. So you won't have to do that for too long. Students will realize after a while that they're gonna have to raise their hand and answer the questions because you're not gonna let them off the hook. But try not to do that. It's really hard. It sounds easy, but wait time is something that really seasoned professionals use. And if you can do that in your classes, just as a regular practice, you're doing a great job. And then of course, if your administrator sees you do that. If I see somebody do wait time, I'm always in awe because I'm the worst at wait time. So really, really focus on that and you can get some higher scores on your evaluations or your walkthroughs, okay? Um, the other thing is you wanna make sure that you give students time you don't, students don't necessarily know the answer to the question right away. You do because you're asking the question. They need 15 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe even a minute. Maybe you ask a question and you say, okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I don't want anybody to raise their hand for 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, then you guys can raise your hands. What that does is that helps the students who need a minute who aren't as fast as those, you know, overachievers in the front of the room, that allows the kids who need a minute or 30 seconds or 15 seconds to think about it before they answer it. And in this way, you're including those students as well. So that's really important. Wait time is key. You got to practice. It's really hard to do, but it really does help to increase student achievement in your classroom. And it brings those students who wouldn't normally answer questions into the arena and allows them to kind of think and answer questions and be successful during that time. Okay. So remember up the level of questioning, ask why, ask how, ask what what does that look like? That's another way. And say more about that. Just telling the student, say more about that is boom. You just bump the level of rigor right there. Wait, don't go in and rescue them. Don't let them off the hook. Allow that dead air to happen. It's okay. And of course, making sure they're raising their hands so that, you know, they're not just calling out and other kids are just waiting for other kids to answer. Okay. That really helps with questioning. And then finally, the last thing that I would encourage you to do is really engage your students. You have to plan thoughtful lessons and really get to know your students and understand what they want to do and how they're going to meet those standards and objectives. There is a big difference between compliance and engagement, and your administrator is looking for that. Your students may be complying by your rules. Your students may be afraid of you and they don't talk out of turn because they you know, they know there's consequences and things like that. And that's okay. You know, we don't want them to be afraid of you, but you know, it's okay for them to be compliant. A good orderly classroom is certainly something that's that's very good, but there's a difference between that and engagement. Engagement is students asking questions, thinking about what they're doing, asking you questions, um, talking to their partners, engaging in the lesson. I know a lot of teachers have issues with phones and electronics and you're trying to compete in this world of you know all these other things, but if you can plan engaging instruction and engaging lessons where students are actively involved with the execution of the lessons, they're a big part of that, that's really gonna help your students stay focused and when your principal or assistant principal walks in and sees engagement, over compliance, you're going to do better on those evaluations and those walkthroughs. So compliance is good. Engagement is better. And a good assistant principal or instructional leader will know the difference in a second. We know exactly what compliance looks like and we know exactly what engagement looks like. All right. So hopefully that clears things up for you, gives you some pointers to use in your classroom. Remember, we're not just doing this for evaluations. We're doing this to become highly effective instructors. That's the most important thing. So hopefully that works for you in your classroom. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel 
channel and hit the notifications button so you're notified when we upload new content. Thank you so much for watching and have an awesome day.